Welcome to Women in WP, a bi-monthly podcast about women who blog, design, develop, and more in the WordPress community. Hi, welcome to Women in WP. I'm Angela Bowman. I'm Tracy Epps. And I'm Amy Masson. Our guest today is Amber Hines. Amber is CEO of Equalize Digital, a website accessibility consulting firm that specializes in accessible WordPress development. Welcome, Amber. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We like to start off each episode asking our guests how they got into WordPress. How did you get started? Uh, So I started actually on WordPress.com in 2009. I, I, so way back when I'm pretty sure I had like a a Zanga blog or something like a long time ago. I don't know if anybody's even heard of that. I had one of those. (laughs) I I took a break from blogging and then I had my first daughter and I was, and we lived across country from family and we said, Hey, maybe we should, uh, maybe I should blog and share pictures of my kids. So I started blogger. Yep. Totally mommy blogger. I lived on Nantucket. I I did that. I have a huge following because I live on a cool Island not a good mommy blogger because I'm not consistent, but you know, (laughs) but uh, so I started on wordpress.com and within about five months, I realized I needed to be self-hosted because I got frustrated with, I think you could do some limited CSS stuff back in 2009 on wordpress.com, but not very much. So I moved to self-hosted and I was just having fun playing around with my website and teaching myself HTML and PHP and all that. And I had a few friends that were like, your website looks good. Can we pay you to do ours? And then all of a sudden I realized I can have a business. <laughs> so that's how I got started. Originally was my mommy blog roots. <laughs> and I have not blogged on my personal blog for a very long time. I keep saying I'm going to, and I'll post like one blog post and then I won't again <laughs> for months. <laughs> it's really just like the gateway drug to web development. I feel like, cause I used to blog a lot and then I'm like, I haven't blogged in forever, but I got into web development because I was having fun, you know, like making designs and then doing yeah. that. And then I was like, oh, I can make websites for all these other things. And then the blogs just kind of go on the wayside. Yeah. You get so busy doing work that you don't do as much. Uh, right. <laughs> they say uh, hire the people that have the like the most out of date website because they're usually just because they're busy with doing client work. At least that's what I yeah. say about mine because it's so out of date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what our so. Equalized Digital is part of um, our agency and it was a shift from our agency. And so that's Roadware Creative is the parent company. And if you go look at that website, it's like, I don't know, five years old. And I'm just like, it's so, every time I look at it, I'm like, it's so bad, I hate it. But we just built a new one <laughs> and a new brand. And we're like, whatever, we'll just abandon that one. I don't know. I do the it same still thing. Brings in need, so I guess, it, you know, I don't Just know. start a new brand. Like when your website gets outdated, just. <laughs> I'm guilty of doing this for my personal it. sites. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, this site, redirect, redirect. This, this site is really old. I just made another one and I just. <laughs> <God>. Redirect. <laughs> I mean, there was a good reason for us having a, a name change too. So it did make sense. Oh. It was <laughs> that I hate the website, but. <laughs> I'm going to go try and look at that website now to see how bad it is. Now, I think that it needs to be in the show notes. Oh, honest. absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it'll make people feel like, oh, okay, well, we're, I'm not alone. Yeah. <laughs> so 2009, when you got started, when did you kind of, dis- did you ever get involved in the WordPress community? Like go to WordCamps or anything? Was that a thing for you? Yeah. So I lived in Nantucket and it's, an island for people who don't know off the coast of Massachusetts, about 30 miles off the coast. It's pretty small. There's only 11,000 year round residents. Um, My husband was a chef and that's why we moved there. He ran a restaurant there Uh, and it was great. It was the best place to live, but there's no one else that does anything. And to be honest, we didn't have very much money. (laughs) So I left the island like once a year when we would leave to go to Target because there are no doors (laughs) on the island. (laughs) Um, so I did not get into WordPress meetups or anything like that until we ended up moving off Nantucket and in 2000 and let me think 14, we moved to Fort Collins, Colorado, and I joined a WordPress meetup there. 
and I joined Girl Develop It also, if you're familiar with that organization. And that was when I really started to learn about things like not cowboy coding. Mm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, local- But we're not supposed to cowboy code? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you what, I'm our CEO. I don't do very much development ever, but every once in a while I'll like help out on support. And I, I get in so much trouble with our developers. Cause what I'll do is I'll be like, well, I know. So I'll just go fix it in the, this is so bad. I'll fix it in the theme editor. And then I go over to Bitbucket and I make a commit on Bitbucket. <laughs> and they're all just like, did you commit that on Bitbucket? That means you did it on a live site. And I was like, that didn't break. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I am not our developer anymore. <laughs> sometimes you can just log in, make a hex code change, and you don't need to do the whole staging stuff. Exactly. I'm like, if it's a site I don't have locally, like, you know, I'm going to defend some stuff. of those changes are okay. As long as you, you know, commit it so other people can pull it down, like, it's good, right? So, um, so in, and I moved to Fort Collins, and that's when I really started learning and um, doing all that. And I actually, got involved with WordCamp Denver. So I was an organizer for WordCamp Denver for two years. And we now live in Texas, we've moved a lot. And uh, I co-organized the Georgetown WordPress meetup, although I will admit that we've been taking a little bit of a COVID hiatus, um, just because we were forced to in the beginning. And then both myself and my co-organizer, who's Bill Erickson, have been working on launching new brands. So we said, well, let's not do too many remote help sessions. So. So you're with Bill Erickson there? I mean, he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's, it's he is so freaking cool. He is. He's very awesome. And it's kind of funny. I So when I first started with WordPress and I moved over to self-hosted and I started looking that I was looking for themes and I was like, okay, I decided to go with Genesis because there were tons of tutorials and it was great for me learning to code. And so I started following him and I definitely had a little bit of a fangirl thing, you know, like, yeah, wow, you're so of cool. Of course. And I met him at Pressnomics. And that's when I learned that he lived in Georgetown, here where we live. And I was like, oh, my father in law lives there. And then some years later, we realized we want to be closer to family. So we moved down here and I messaged him. I was like, I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> I know who you are, but. And he's like, oh yeah, I remember you. We met at Press Nomics. And I was like, yeah, so we just moved to town. So we got together and decided to start a meetup together because there wasn't one here, which is fun. And did you and I, we crossed paths at the Denver meet, uh, uh, WordCamp. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think, I don't know if we were on a panel together or- I don't think I was on any panels. Or or something. I don't when know. was the last WordCamp, what, what Denver WordCamps did you organize? I organized 2000, hold on, 2015 and 2016, maybe 2000, yeah, 2015, 2016. Did I, okay, I did the keynote for one and I'm like, which one did I? <laughs> They all run that together. Have, they run together, but I think I spoke at 2015 maybe. Okay. And pro so then I would have seen you at whatever. Yeah. And then did we ever see each other at the Fort Collins meetup? I don't know. I, I, don't, I mean, I was one of the main organizers for it for a long time. So. I just rec I more recently started going and I've presented uh, once or twice there. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Is that a Hayes. big meetup? Is it a Fort large one? Collins, at least in my experience and from like talking to other people, I feel like it's pretty big. Like the texting in Fort Collins is really cool. Um, Colorado yeah. in general, I feel like does really well. So I, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but one of the things I love about Colorado, and if you're in Colorado, it's good to know, but they do this competition every year called Go Code Colorado, which is through the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State funds, it's a um, like an app development competition where they're trying to get people to use open data because Colorado is super into open data. Um, and, and they do different competitions in different cities around the state. Um, and then they have a finalist, a final in Denver and the top three teams get $30,000 to build their app. Wow. Really cool. So um, cool. and, uh, really cool. and I feel like that, that has helped a lot in our meetup, at least when I was there in Fort Collins, we had enough that we would meet twice a month and we'd have a developer focus and a user focus. So here in Georgetown, it's pretty, we pretty much do a user focus. We every once in a while we tried in the beginning to like alternate or have and it, and it was like people would come and they're like we have no idea what you guys are talking about. 
I was like, this is just me and Bill teaching each other. Things. <laughs> I don't know, you know, like, <laughs> so, so mostly we're user focused, but Fort Collins has a good, a good, like, feel. There's a lot of people there and a lot of tech kind of stuff going on. I, I love it. I just actually spent the weekend in Fort Collins. Um, I live in Boulder, so I'm an hour away, but my daughter and granddaughter live there. So I went up for the weekend and just played yeah. <laughs> with them. Like we went, I, spent all day at the park every day. Besides WordPress meetup that I miss, I also miss, miss the breweries. And, <laughs> yeah. And they have, the, most, two they have the best playgrounds too for little kids. They have, they are breweries playground and heaven. playgrounds. That's so, right. And you well, can bike to the mall. The also in Fort Collins, they're the same a lot of times. Mm. <laughs> I'm I'm from Milwaukee, so I totally understand this. Yes, yeah. this, this culture thing we have going on. Yeah, yeah. It's funny you were talking about I back when I first kind of got involved in just the tech community in general here in Milwaukee. We had so much more. We had um, well, because uh, Meetup. Uh, we had I think a web develop web web developer Meetup. And then Meetup started charging. So then they branched off because like, we're all web developers. So we did that. So then Web 414 came up. But then someone was like, oh, we need a web developer uh, thing. So like then another one started up. And then there was like a designer, web designer Meetup that came. And then so it we had like these three different like levels just kind of all working together. But then like, I, had, I don't know, it just probably wasn't sustainable or like that culture seemed to just kind of shift where people weren't, you know, like meeting up in person again i wonder now this makes me uh wonder if like now because we've been so isolated that when we get back into where we can actually meet up safely will that change we'll be like i'm gonna go to all of these things or, or have we all used to staying at home that we want to yeah i don't know i think it'll be interesting to see too because there's been some neat collaborations like wordpress mega meetups and that kind of stuff where a bunch of wordpress groups are doing virtuals It'll be interesting to see how much of that continues. Well, and I like that idea because you're saying you're like, oh, well, at uh, oh, Georgetown or whatever, you're like, the, oh, they're user focused and just stuff. So the, 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 the niche of developer, like we want to do these hardcore, like really complex things is small in most localities, but then mm -hmm. like national or international like there would be that interest and yeah. so i could see that kind of um those kind of uh specific like developer focused or ux ui focused uh within wordpress really could really do well mm -hmm. especially now we have all the technology we're used to it yeah i right? know we were using zoom because we were we're a remote company so we've been using zoom for a long time and i used to always have to explain to my, my clients what zoom was because we're like this is how we're going to meet with you we prefer that over phone because we can share screens and they're all just like, wait a minute, what? Uh -huh. Now everybody knows it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, once this COVID stuff has passed and we are free to go places, I'm going to go to all the things and all yeah. the places. I don't care if I could do it over Zoom. I just want to be out and be with my people. Yeah. There's, there's definitely, you know, some of the networking stuff, especially in the conference side or the WordCamp side, you just don't get the same. And I know that there's some cool WordPress things that are more conferency that have been happening and they even tried to have sponsor mm -hmm. like virtual sponsor tables and i'm just it's not the same so not the same you're right i'll definitely yeah. do those kinds of things but but yeah i don't know i have moments when i i'm kind of glad <laughs> i'm like it's nice our youngest is 15 months old so honestly like we got it didn't it wasn't so bad like spending more time with her last year than we might have otherwise that's so. nice yeah, I can totally see like it going both ways, but then also, um, well, you, you talk about you focus on accessibility and mm -hmm. one of the big things that I have been noticing, well, especially when we're seeing so many things having to rely on digital, how much more crucial that accessibility for everyone is. So like the awareness hopefully has gone up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully that those uh, kind of accessibility and access um, disparities will kind of be better or made better. Um, what kind of things have you um, experienced within the company of like projects that you've been doing, especially when it comes to like accessibility and kind of readjusting to kind of life online versus in person? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting, the conferences and digital event space, I feel like 
I'm not seeing as much progress on the accessibility side as I would like to see, to be honest. Yeah, um, same. I, um, I have a couple of connections that I've met through prior events, or I'm a member of the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, which is great if you're looking to learn about accessibility. I highly recommend it. Um, and and that's like an ongoing conversation that I've been having with some of them. Um, there's uh, one woman, her name is Marilyn. She's she's fabulous. She spoke at WordPress Accessibility Day, so she has a talk about that. She is a deaf person and she t talks a lot about captioning and that kind of stuff. And it's interesting, like her just talking about Zoom and the challenges that it presents has presented for her. Um, and, and I, you know, I wish I would see more even a lot of diversity and inclusion conferences fail to think about accessibility, yeah. which is crazy to me that we we don't think about that. Um, and so I, I think that's one thing that we actually had a fair number of live conference clients that we've been working with for a number of years. Um, and some of them have just gone on hiatus and some of them have tried to tr transition to online. And so it's something that we personally, as an organization, have been trying to be like, hey, this is something you should think about. Um, but it is, it's hard and it's hard, especially with, for like those events that were in person and they were getting a lot of their funding. One of our really big conference clients, um, they, like, I think they lost more than half their revenue last year, you know? So then to say, you should pay somebody $200 an hour to do live captioning of your event is really hard when they're just trying to think about how can we transition to online? Now we're debating, you know, we used to charge people $500 for a ticket and now we're maybe charging them 40, like, and there's fewer sponsors because the sponsors are like, yeah, not worth it. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. And that's, the, I think that's probably one of the biggest pain points I think in accessibility is figuring out how to make the value really obvious to the companies, whether it's an event or just like a website accessibility, how to make that value make sense to them, but also like, how can we make it affordable? Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of companies like ours, and I mean, we've tried really hard to be thoughtful about how we do our audits and pricing for that and, and all that kind of thing. But you know, I've talked to other individuals at companies where, you know, they're like, our audits start at fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. And I'm like, you know, for a small business owner, that's less than what they paid for their website. <laughs> they're not gonna do that. More than what they paid more, for yeah. their website. Or sorry, yes, yes. a lot more. Yeah. More than what, that's more. what it's more. It's a lot more, right? If they're if they're thinking I paid like five thousand dollars. So then it's like, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out how can you make this affordable or what can we do like can we get more templates or out of the box WordPress themes that are accessibility ready? And then what can we do to train people that are doing their own content creation so that it's easier for them to make their websites accessible without having to go hire a company that's gonna charge them more than they have in their budget? Well, and one of the things that, especially with um, web development, when I do and when I talk through, like e even when I'm doing product design, um, accessibility doesn't have to be a huge, um, huge cost, but that requires you to start thinking about accessibility right from the first, like the first meeting, like right away, because then you're thinking through it and then being able to build that in. So you're not then spending twice as much or three times as much to try to like fix up things that, that could have been just done in, in the, in the, during the development phase. And uh, one of the things like I did see, cause I, I, I've been noticing a lot with, you know, with captions and such. Um, one thing I was a, a speaker at WordFest and what I really kind of liked first, what they did is all of our talks were pre-recorded and we had to submit them early, early on. Mm -hmm. And, and they said, and here's where you put your caption file. And I was like, oh, okay. So then there was like this talk about here's some of the tools to use this. And I was like, oh, so now all the pre recorded, all the sessions had captions in them without having to have that extra cost. But that was that 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 balance between what's a live event and then what's pre recorded. And then they had the questions afterwards. And I thought it was a good balance. Um, and it allowed for a little bit more accessibility um, considerations without adding adding the cost to it. 
Yeah, well, and I think it's great too that they just said, here's where you put your caption file. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is everyone's planning to give us captions, right? Exactly, and exactly. And probably wouldn't have thought of that, you know. Exactly, and then there was this talk of like, oh, what, 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 where do I get this file? And they're like, we'll try this. Even just the free version of like, we'll get you this because you, you know, your talks are 30 minutes. So that falls within this free thing. I was like, oh, look at that. That's interesting. It works really well. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, I noticed um, that you had instituted something when you um, organized WordCamp Denver to try to ensure that more women were speaking. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So the first year that I was a WordCamp Denver organizer, we at least at that time, the way we handled speaker applications is they went onto a Trello board and it was sort of organized by the categories they were in. And then there were, there weren't a ton of us organizers. So we all kind of would go and we would drag them over to like, these are ones we think are interesting. And I started to notice, I was like looking at all the names and and, and I was thinking, and I don't think we asked any, we didn't ask any diversity questions on the speaker application, which I'm actually a huge proponent for. I think we should have quotas and we should ask that because it makes for a, a much better conference in my experience. But, um, but I was just looking at the names. Of course, you can't fully gender people based on their names, but it became pretty clear that from uh, at least what the names looked like that we had, we had selected zero female speakers and we were pretty, we hadn't notified anyone yet, but it was like, they're like, okay, we think we have our list. And I looked at it and I was like, wait a minute. So I, I said, everyone pause. I'm going to go through because we did have flags where people could say we're from Colorado. Cause we were like, we're going to give preference to people from Colorado, like some of those things. So I literally went through and I started, I either gendered people, which is bad, but either gender people, or if I couldn't tell, I would like look at their LinkedIn or try and see, can I figure out? And I started putting flags on female, 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 because, and I was like, so look at this, like, these are all the women who uh, applied to speak. And we literally selected none. And so I said, we have to do something about this. We have to go back and revisit. And, and I actually, we do a lot of work with lesbians who tech, which is a conference mm. Uh, in the LGBT. I love them. Yep. Yeah. So they've been a client of mine since 2014. And um, one of the things that I love about Lesbians Who Tech, I don't know if you've ever been to a Lesbians Who Tech event. I was um, at the the first, um, the one in San Francisco, the first okay. event yeah. that they had. It was so much fun. Yeah. I've never been to San Francisco, but we've been to the New York one. And then um, when they do like the road shows, sometimes we'll go depending on how close it is. Mm -hmm. um, but they, Leanne Pittsford, who is the founder, she has always from the very beginning said that we're going to have diversity quotas on our speakers. And that is the most, not just, not just um, from a gender perspective, diverse conference, but also from a racial perspective, very, like the most diverse conference I have ever been to. And they're, I mean, they're, if you go look, you can see, I don't know what their exact stats are, but they like will get like a certain percentage of people who identify as black or African-American, Latinx people, like all of that sort of thing, people on the whole gender perspective. So it's not only women, it's not only lesbians, even though that's their name, like they always have allies too. Um, and they have male speakers um, and trans speakers and all that. And, and, and it really brings a lot of value to the conference. And so that was one thing when I came on and I saw that at WordCamp Denver and it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. Nobody was saying, it was just, they were just looking at the top names. But I think the thing is, is you have to, you have to sort of think like, what's going to create a good, well-rounded user experience, user experience of our conference, right? Attendee experience. Um, and, and the more diverse of voices you can have, the better it is. And it's also good, I think for WordCamps, like sometimes we might get like the big name people and get all excited, which is awesome. But if you only pick people like that, or you only pick people that have been in the industry for a really long time, they might bring stuff that is not as helpful to somebody who's just getting started. Like sometimes it's great to have a speaker who I'm, this is, I've never talked at a conference before. And this is, I've only been working with WordPress for a year, but I'm excited about this thing, you know? And, mm -hmm. and 
and attendees can relate to that because they're going to be attendees that are new too. And then that might inspire them to talk. And so that's one thing that I think, you know, besides the gender, but also looking at like, I think it'd be great to ask people, you know, how long have you been doing WordPress? And then say, we're going to choose at least 10% of our speakers have to be, you know, two years or less or something like that. Right. And not just trying to get the big WordPress superhero names, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, and one of the things you said, like, that you know um the whole like i know people think of like oh well with these quotas you know like what is that that's that that's that then you're then you're trying to stack it this way i'm like no really because we we have to be intentional to break that um because we will we all just just things that are subconscious that we don't even realize that go within our decisions is going to favor the status quo or the things that we're used to. And so, but then also if we're at the deciding table and we are the people that are very well prominently displayed on the speakers and the organizers, and then we will also be the attendees, but you have someone come in of, uh, of a different color, a different race, a different background, um, and they don't see themselves on the stage, they think, well, am I welcomed here? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, is this a place for me? So having that intentionality is only going to like help ev everything because then people will learn something from others and it's going to welcome more people into that group and make them feel like you are a part of this and you are valued, uh, so we want, and that just, I mean, that just benefits everyone. And that's mm -hmm. why Tracy and I are here because we met at a conference that had like no women. <laughs> well, yep. it did. It was, but it was like, we counted, we counted. It was like 12%, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I noticed that at the very first WordCamp US and, you know, there were women speakers, but it was maybe like 25%. And, but if you notice the, from 2015 to the last one, which was, I think 50%. And somebody made the point, somebody had to have made the point to do equality with women versus men speakers mm -hmm. at that point. I think it was, it, it had to have been a conscious be. decision. Well, and I remember that 2015 WordCamp because I, so I think it was in 2013, I wasn't chosen to speak, but I was like really a part of the community, the local community, because they were going after the titles mm -hmm. of the people. And so I went to the organizers and I said, I'm just, I, I don't like this stuff, you know? And I said, I'm sorry, but you have to allow me to speak. And I got really, I had this very strongly worded email and just like, this is who I am. This is what I do. I am a part of this and you have to find a place for me to speak. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, they, 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 find, but they had all their, uh, but then in 2015, the one that you did, I was, I think, more like invited, like the thing Patrick came to me and said, hey, we want you to do a talk. And that may have been the one where you said, whoa, it's all men. Because then someone came to me and I hadn't even applied, I think. And they're like, we understand that you know about security. Could you give a talk? And I was like, oh, well, I was begging to talk a couple of years ago and had to wedge my way in. It might've been 2012, actually, something. Mm -hmm. There was something that happened that it was just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. But when I look at the WordCamp Denver roster for that year that you worked on it, it's all the women that I know in our community were speaking there. And there's mm -hmm. so many, and it was like amazing. And so I think that, uh, yeah, that effort that you put through really brought the, these are women people know, they relate to, and they're already a part of the community and to not see them there would have been weird. Mm -hmm. And so you, you think about good. like you, like how you were like, oh, wait, I need to do this. How many women would do that? We're like conditioned to not do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I think that was one of the big things when, when we started this, um, was like, we're, we want to be intentional in inviting people because, you know, we've had so many people like, oh, well, I don't know. I just did this. I just made this largest pro plugin, most popular plugin to do this because I could, I, you know, I couldn't find something. And it was like, just like, if, that's amazing. <laughs> exactly. It's amazing. And I could guarantee, I, I know a good percentage of men, very, very capable and would, would, not in a in a flaunting way but they would they would like lean into that and be like i have done this we as women we were like 
well, I mean, okay, I guess I kind of did that, you know, and that we're just conditioned with that with the society. And so sometimes that requires that, yeah, we're inviting and reaching out to women or people of color um, or those that we don't see. We're intentionally doing that. That's just because they are not, they're conditioned or wouldn't step up in because they don't feel like that's their place but so but it's still like that's that um that balance there and i think that's one reason why we like with all the guests that we've had on the show we've been like people are like oh i never thought about being on a podcast i was like but you're amazing like yeah. look at, why aren't you on 50 podcasts right exactly this community wordpress itself would crumble without people like you like so I'm curious when you noticed that and that you hadn't picked any women, what was the ratio, if you remember, of women applicants to men applicants? Uh, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell you an exact number, but I feel like it was, I don't know, it was easily double, if not more, male applicants. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, um, like Angela said, like we actually went out and asked more women to speak. Um, Patrick, by the way, has also done that for WooConf when he was organizing WooConf. So he's we love really Which Patrick. was the most amazing <laughs> conference I've ever been to. It gives me goosebumps to think about it because in terms of feeling inclusivity and diversity and like I belonged, it was the only tech conference I went to that I felt 100% good and not insecure at. WooConf. Woo -conf. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked to Patrick. I said, I don't know what you did here, but you did something and it's amazing. I spoke at WooConf in um, 2017 when my third daughter was four months old and I took her with me and they, they made me a nursing room, which was so nice. Like, I that's didn't what I remember. I actually like, met you. She, she went, oh, maybe that's where we met. Yeah. yeah. And you were at the nursing room. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah, no, no, that's, it's a great card. I think, you know, so I think the thing that's interesting besides like going out, if you don't have them, um, is also trying to do, and this is great for WordPress meetups to do. And I, I believe we did this in Fort Collins the following year before WordCamp Denver is we had a meetup all about like speaking at WordCamp. We're, we talked about what do you need to do to apply? Why you should do it? What are some ideas for topics? Because it doesn't just have to be like crazy coding. Like it, it could be SEO or it could be how to write good content. It could, you know, like it could be all these different things that people who have never been to a WordCamp might not know. But, but I think the, the idea behind that too was to try and encourage some people who wouldn't normally have thought about applying to speak, to speak and to give them the thought in their head, oh, this is something I can do. It's not scary. And I mean, WordCamps are great. Like that is the best place to start speaking. I agree. Um, so I think that's something that helped. And I know Girl Develop It too. Also, we did one for them. Girl Develop It is an awesome meetup if you're interested in learning more about code and networking with other women. So um, I, yeah. I think that's a big piece though, too, is trying to get out the word. I saw, um, I want to say it was like Atlassian with their Teams conference. On their speaker application this year, it literally said, we are not going to only pick people that are experienced speakers. Like they wanted to know who was a beginner or hadn't really spoken very much. And the, and they they wrote it. They're like, this will this will not hurt you to give us an honest answer here because we are trying to, we will include mentoring too. So if you're nervous and speaking at a giant conference, it's okay. You can still apply. And then if we select you, we will mentor you and coach you and help you figure out how to be a good speaker um, or amazing. how to feel comfortable, right? Which is like so cool. Yeah, for me, I remember once I kind of realized because I always thought, oh, I can't, I don't, I don't know enough code. I, I've taught, I'm self-taught, but I knew it about design. And then it wasn't until I realized that because I always just thought like, oh, well, the stuff I know, just everyone knows, it's just common knowledge. And then when people are like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you do that, I'm like, I, okay, well, that, that's valuable. Like, oh, so understanding like when when conferences and word camps, they say, we're not only looking for developer talks because people usually get intimidated by that. You can say, do you know something about SEO and like spelling it out and be like, wait a minute, I, I do that. Oh, I didn't know I could talk about that. I, like, and that just opens up a whole other world. 
Yeah. And sometimes even just like case study type talks, I really yeah. love, I think are so interesting where someone's just like, they're like sharing their website and the journey and building it or, yeah. um, or, a, or specific clients or something like that. Or they're talking about, here's this thing, this problem we had and here's how we fixed it. Um, and I feel like anyone who works with WordPress has a story like that, whether it's their own website or it's one they did for a client. Totally. Uh, and we can learn so much from those kinds of talks too. I agree. I learn more from those than I do some, a lot of other ones actually. Because yeah. something, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that I like to, I need to apply something to, I need like real, real life application to something for me for it to stick so that I'm like oh I can relate to that I can mm -hmm. see it it's yeah that's I, I think you're right on that yeah in terms of accessibility I am working with the University of Colorado mm -hmm. and part of my contract is I have to have double A accessibility and it's interesting because our, our budget like you said could double <laughs> for, you know, if we were to have to hire an accessibility company, but I, I've run a lot of the CU sites through accessibility tools and stuff, and they're not all passing. And mm -hmm. so what I do for my accessibility is I run a variety of tools. And I think about the colors, CU came up with brand colors that weren't accessible at one point. <laughs> so I'm like, so they want us to pass accessibility, but the brand colors we're forced to use are not accessible. But then they changed it and, and then they did come up with one color color that wasn't black um, that was accessible. And so we could use that for buttons, you know, because um, gold, light gold is not a good accessible color for accent. And um but yeah, so I run it through all the tools and stuff and I just kind of work things until they pass and I test with the keyboard. I make sure that I can navigate the site with the keyboard and stuff. But, you know, I feel like, wow, I'm not an expert. It takes hours though for a single site to run through all of the pages and make sure like, oh, I use Facet WP plugin and the facets are not accessible. They're not, the inputs are not, don't have proper label, but I found some jQuery where I could do some jQuery to make a proper uh, uh, ID um, for the like select list and, and write in a label in the HTML so it would pass accessibility. So I've done things like that. Do you feel like, <laughs> do you feel like kind of novices in that way? Like I am, I'm a developer, so I know how to understand these things, can manage to make sites accessible and how much do you feel like you really have to bring, you know, at what point do you feel like you need to bring the experts in for the accessibility, like more for apps or, you know, what? Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't call yourself a novice, right? If you're a developer and you know how to do code. <laughs> oh, good. <But> okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe you haven't done as much on the accessibility side, but you're definitely not a novice, right? So, because I, I think that, so a big portion of accessibility, which I'm sure you know, is just how the content is entered on the page. And, yep. and, and that's, you know, a big thing that maybe a lot of people don't think about as much. Like it's, it's theme, but it's also in a lot of ways, it's just how content is entered. Um, and certainly anyone can use different sorts of testing tools to figure that out. Uh, do you use a screen reader when you do testing? No, but I would like to. And so I kind of would like, you know, and we can put this in our show notes too later, so we don't have to necessarily have you list them all out, but I would like to use this opportunity since we have you that we could educate our listeners and we could put in the show notes for anyone listening, some tools that am that you would recommend, you yeah. know, recommended so, by Amber Hines. <laughs> um, so Macs all have voiceover on them and that okay. is free. It's included in a Mac. If you are on a PC, then I typically recommend NVDA and NVDA yes. tends to work best in Firefox, but you can use it in Chrome too. Um, but um, those and NVDA is open source and free. The other really popular screen reader that has a large user base is JAWS and is not open source and it costs money. So if you're just trying to figure out like screen reader testing, that might not be where you start. Um, and 
And I would say the way we do it is we do keyboards. So you navigate through, make sure your focus state is there. Your focus never gets lost the whole time down the page. And okay. then we do a loop back after we fixed everything that's keyboard problem. And then we do a loop back with screen readers and we always test with at least two. Um, and I would say if you, if you are a developer and you feel comfortable sort of puzzling through problems, then 100% you can identify issues between the free scanning tools, whether you're using Wave, um, Axe, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that, comes from DQ okay. and it has Chrome and Firefox extensions and it yeah. puts the reports in the um, in DevTools panel. Mm -hmm. And I really like Axe. I feel like it's actually more thorough than Wave is. So um, if you between those tools and then also we have a plugin for WordPress called Accessibility Checker that does scanning similar and it puts reports right on the dashboard. Um, and your post or page edit screen, which is really useful when you're handing the website off to a client and they're going to be adding new blog posts or editing content on a page because it will show them right there. Oh, hey, you missed a heading level or your color contrast is wrong because your button, <laughs> you didn't pick the right colors, even though WordPress also now has a little warning about that, which is great. Um, so, so between that and doing the testing, I feel like anyone can probably figure out what the problems is or what the problems are, what is maybe more challenging depending upon someone's ability and coding is figuring out the fix for the problem. Mm -hmm. So I think most people can tab through, like we were just auditing a website that used a popular page builder and it had like a blog post carousel. And when you hit tab, it tabbed to like blog posts that were not visible in the carousel. And it, it, you had to go through, I don't know, like five of them and you're just hitting tab. And the only reason I know is because I have in my, I have, it's showing me where my focus is in dev panels. I have console set to log <laughs> where my focus is. So, uh, so I'm like, okay, I have to tab through an image and a title and a read more button like for five blog posts. So it's like 15 tabs. Oh, until you can progress on the page. Well, but also before it even becomes visible on the three blog posts that are visible in the carousel, because it was going to the ones that aren't visible, right? So, so I think a lot of people, you could tab and be like, hold on, it's tabbing, I have no idea where I am. And, and But then that's where if you don't have a lot of skills, you might be like, well, what do I do? Honestly, my response to that is there's no reason to have your blog post in a carousel. So you just get rid of the carousel. <laughs> like it's way better than recoding this thing. Like, yes, <laughs> yes. And trust me, I do so much. My other top secret on this, if you can't afford, we do user testing and we work with students from Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired, which is amazing. We hire them and they we can get students that are really experienced and also students that are not super experienced with the screen reader, which is useful too, because if you, it wouldn't just be younger people, it could also be someone who is newly blind. They might not be as expert and they're just learning how to do it, could come on your website. Um, but if you can't do a lot of user testing um, because of budgetary reasons or whatever, then I like Hotjar. Is oh, yeah. Like Hotjar. I like Hotjar. So Hotjar, you put a JavaScript snippet on and it records sessions so you can watch people navigate through your website. And with other, what also is really useful is it tells you what device they're on and what browser. Mm. So you can see like all these different screen widths. Like it's great for just like, oh, did we miss one little thing in our responsive? Like maybe we need to adjust our break <laughs> point <laughs> here. But that's like one of our like things that is also really useful because you can see like, how are people going down the page? What looks like they got confused on? Because accessibility, it's about like the digital functional, but really what it comes down to is it's more than meeting WCAG, web content accessibility mm -hmm, guidelines. Mm -hmm. It's about making your website usable. Yes. So part of accessibility is also having a navigation structure that makes sense. Having a sitemap in the footer of your page so they can get to anything quickly, right? Um, and so I, th I feel like anyone can make their website accessible as long as they're thoughtful and they're sort of conscientious. And that goes back to the budget, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a big budget, but there are there will be some problems that come up that someone who is more on the designer or like the WordPress yeah. power user side. Well, like that jQuery problem, I had to use jQuery to solve the yeah. problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so some people might not be able to do that. And so that's where you might want to hire, you know, a, 
a developer or you might want to hire an accessibility specialist who can also be like, oh, hey, here's some other items you miss. Um, and then and and then there's things that are like nuanced that don't get caught by yeah. testing tools. So for example, our scanner and any scanner like way of acts, they'll tell you if an image is missing and all, but it can't really verify the quality of your alt text. Mm -hmm. And so one thing we see a lot on our websites where clients are trying to be really diligent is they get overly verbose in their alt text and they put these like really long descriptions of images that are just like extraneous and don't make any sense and they're gonna slow someone down. Um, or another thing we see is they describe the image even though it's a linked image. And when you have a linked image, which is what we call a functional image, mm -hmm. The, the alt text shouldn't actually describe what the image is. It should describe, should the, describe the link where it's going. Yep. So we, I saw this on a website last week and it was like, they were just saying like um, map icon when really it goes to their contact page uh -huh. like, on it, you know, like that kind of thing. We are like, well, but you don't want someone to think if I follow this link, I'm getting a map icon. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or even like your logo in the homepage, it shouldn't just say logo. It should say like, you know, visit equalize digital's homepage. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's what's really confusing because I think the SEO community really conflicts with the accessibility community because in SEO they're like use your alt text for SEO and accessibility is like use your alt text for accessibility. And well, the two but things for me, do not I feel go like together. They should because good SEO is going to like if your site is and for me usability and accessibility should be the same thing because mm -hmm. otherwise you're just saying usability for only portion of my um my my audience is usable, but then the other part I'm not worried about. But technically, well, Google wants things that are going to be usable by everyone and resourceful. So I think I don't understand. I think it they don't come like they, they don't do. They do on, on all texts. They totally conflict because if well, it, if it is a a linked image, it it serves a different purpose than a, yeah. an image in in the body content. But I, I think the thing I always say if somebody says something to me like that is you're not, Google doesn't like keyword stuffing. Like that's a thing we used yeah, to do. Exactly. Like make the, the alt text on every image on the page, just have the keywords for that page, right? But Google's gotten smarter and, mm -hmm. and they don't like that. And so, no, you should really describe your image and, and it should make sense in the flow of the page as they're interacting. Like, there's a reason why you chose that image and you put that image in that position and not somewhere else. Like it, it needs to make sense. And then if you do it that way, logically, and it makes sense, then it is good for SEO. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And trying to just like mm -hmm. stick a bunch of keywords on it or like repeat the post title on as the alt for them. Mm -hmm. That's not good. People think that's good for SEO, but it's not. It might've well, been yeah, yeah, exactly. And like Google figures out like, oh, they're doing this to game the system. And then they're like, well, nope. And we just improved it. And now they are not on any of the first five pages. People were like, I was on page one or two. And now all of a sudden I can't even find my posts anymore. Right. Yep, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I have, I mean, I feel like it's only a matter of time before SEO becomes a ranking signal or sorry, uh, accessibility becomes a ranking signal. I think it already yeah, I is. I, yeah, I agree. Like, I, like I, Google also already, like already gives you like a kind of like a prominence or priority for like responsive and mobile friendly sites. Mm -hmm. I think same thing. I, yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think it may be a little bit, but I think at some point they're going to straight up say to us, this impacts your rank in search. Um, and I mean, hints on that is that Lighthouse includes an accessibility score. Uh, and also maybe two or three years ago now, Google put out a, it's like a developer focused course on Udacity that's free. So anyone can take it on accessibility. Um, and, and I'm like, they're starting to put effort into this. It's only a matter of time. Yeah. So. Nice. Wow. Well, it has been a great conversation with you today. Before we go, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yep. So um, I'm at equalizedigital.com. And I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So I, my LinkedIn name is just Amber Hines, all one word. And um, 
that's probably the best way to find me. You're also welcome to email me, amber at equalizedigital.com. I love talking accessibility. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for listening. Interested in being on the show? Sign up on our website, womenandwp.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram and join our Facebook group to have conversations with other women in WordPress.